In Stirling Castle, carved portraits used to decorate King James V's presence chamber. In 1777, they caused the collapse of the roof. Now, over 200 years after, historic Scotland are restoring it to its former glory. While recarving the portraits, a question arose over the markings on one head in particular. Now, on BBC Radio 4, we attempt to unravel the mystery of head number 20. Each head has got its own mystery to be unravelled. As a marketing gift, it's phenomenal. A large number of reporters and broadcasters came and it went out all over the world. Roslyn is uh, riding on the crest of a wave because of the Da Vinci Code and Stirling won't be that far behind. Stirling Palace is the noblest I ever saw in Europe. There is no apartment in Windsor or Hampton Court that comes near it. Why? Because in the roof of the presence chamber are the carved heads of the kings and queens of Scotland. From the writings of Jane Graham, 1817, wife of General Samuel Stevenson Graham, Deputy Governor of Stirling Castle. None of the royal palaces in Scotland appears to have been so favoured by King James V as the Castle of Stirling. The most extraordinary room in the castle was his presence chamber. Here the roof was completely covered by a series of rich carvings in oak. In all, there is an elegance of attitude, a delicacy of expression, an air of unequivocal high breeding. The heads in oak themselves must appear to everyone who considers them with attention and compares them with similar decorations elsewhere to possess all the variety, individuality and life of portraits. The exquisite elegance of the workmanship, as well as the spirit and feeling of the designs, entitle them to high admiration. I'm John Donaldson, a woodcarver from Livingston in Scotland. Historic Scotland had been in process of um, refurbishing the castle. Obviously, the Great Hall was the first part of the project. They decided, let's carve all of the heads. As it happens, it was me that, that did the job. What I was having to do was to copy as rigorously as I possibly could the original carver's work. On head number 20, what we've got is, is uh, a border that's not that... Uh, uncommon in the heads. It's decorative, essential, it's decorative. It's an inner border, a rim, and an outer border. I'm Barnaby Brown. Head number 20 is exceptional in its quality of execution and in having a, an inscription, a kind of perimeter inscription, that is baffling. This is the only one where the sequence seems to have no rhyme or reason and kind of enigmatic, cryptic, uh, something going on. I believe head one is King James V himself, and number two his wife, Mary Queen of Guise. Head seven is not improbably Sir William Wallace, and in regards to most of the other heads, no satisfactory intelligence has been collected. I feel I must try to conserve these magnificent heads, so, if they are to become lost, they may be looked upon in the years to come. Researchers say they have discovered the oldest known instrumental music in Scotland. It sounds like something right out of the Da Vinci Code. It's a mysterious stone on a castle ceiling that holds a secret musical score. As in all the best code-breaking stories, there was one completely accidental breakthrough moment. In a grand Scottish castle on an antique carving in the king's bedchamber, a craftsman noticed something strange. 
Head number 20 was one of the first heads into the job. What we have is a portrait of a woman looking to the side and she has a brooch about her hanging from her neck with a little head on it, like a little cupid that's looking downwards. The rim on number 20 has got what I thought at the time were just decorative cuts and that's not unusual. There are quite a number of the heads that have got this decorative rim. The quality of the carving is so superior, not just relative to the other heads, but relative to carving in Europe as a whole. I mean, it is an exceptional piece. I mean, quite extraordinarily beautiful. The depth of the carving, the, the quality uh, of the, the, the figure itself, and all the decoration, it's magnificent. It must be said that the borders with which each head is surrounded flourish in the utmost variety of elegant markings. I discovered that it was not a simple repeat pattern of one and nothing. Actually, it was a series of phrases that suggested to me that it was some sort of code. It was at that stage that I started to ask around and search for information from people. One day, a chap said to me, well, ones and nothings are, of course, binary, and uh, that's what it might be. Given my uh, inclination towards nonsense, I was saying, well, 1540, you don't even have black and white telly then. But as it happened, that's what it turned out to be. There was four years uh, gap between me doing that head uh, and discovering the link between the binary and harp music. That happened absolutely fortuitously because I was sitting looking at a documentary on the development of the harp and the harpist was being tutored in medieval harp. And she had a little bit of a problem and he said to her, just remember that all medieval string notation was written in binary, a series of ones and nothings. So that, that was a bit of a eureka moment and leapt off the sofa and from then on in it was a matter of trying to find out anybody who would take the thing a, a little bit further. And then we uh, finally found Barnaby Brown in Glasgow. I'm a lecturer at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. I had never heard of the heads. Um, uh, it was simply John Donaldson, I think, had done a little bit of research into ones and zeros and figured out that Barnaby Brown was the man to contact. Because I teach this stuff in my lectures, um, except my material is exclusively Welsh. The evidence we have is Welsh, uh, uh, as far as ones and zeros are concerned. My name is Bill Taylor. I'm a specialist in historical harp music, both as an instrument maker and as a performer. I first learned about the um, head number 20 by way of a friend, Barnaby Brown, who had been in touch with John Donaldson. I had been involved in a TV program about the history of the harp. And um, so in investigating that, he went back through Barnaby and Barnaby led him to me. Head number 20 is, is unique in that around the frame, we find a string of symbols for which we do not know what they could refer to. However, they also relate to the notation that was used by medieval Welsh harp players in the 14th and 15th centuries, who used ones and zeros as elements of musical composition. In that tradition, one represented a feeling of resolution, of arriving back at home, of settled state. The zero indicated a moment of tension which contrasted with the, the final resolution. If we assign the feeling of home to this sonority and the feeling of away, down a step to the away, the, the, the zero, we have for one zero one 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 zero. a little bit zippier. So 
that is um, something that I took on board as I prepared uh, an interpretation which is now being used at Stirling Castle, as I understand. It's not a score where specific notes are written. It provides a, a kind of blueprint or a skeleton onto which a musician can not just put the clothes, but bring to life and, and, and uh, deviate from in creative ways. And that, in fact, is part of the interest of this period of music. With very little rehearsal, Bill and I managed to put together something that was, I suppose, compelling. did the original presentation at Stirling Castle, I had in front of me a piece of paper with the 10111, 10100000, whatever that had been, that had actually been folded up and put in my pocket. And I, I had, it, so it was a little bit crumpled, and I was sitting on a music stand in front of me, and the TV crew was trying to film me and the harp, and they were actually filming the page, the very page I was working from, which was actually, um, printed A4, it just happened to be a little bit um, rough, like someone, I spilled tea on it, you know, and sort of, <laughs> as if it was the ancient, ancient manuscript itself. The harp certainly was the great court instrument of the day. There's sadly no harp music as such which has survived as harp music. The Welsh medieval um, harp music is unique in that it's actual harp music. It isn't just a tune that was played on the harp. We know that this was what the harp players did, so there's, very, there's great significance there. It would have been used to accompany the great poetry, which would have been used to praise or blame the rulers. So the music, if this is an example of music, it gives evidence that the compositional um, structure was similar to that of Wales. So perhaps these musical traditions, uh, particularly dance music in Scotland and the medieval Welsh harp music, there are many parallels uh, that one can draw. If it's music, then it's, it's very significant because it, it demonstrates that the Welsh way of teaching music, of transmitting music, of thinking about music, wasn't exclusive to Wales. I suppose I have to be honest and say that there are doubts. I do have doubts. I'm not certain at all that it's music. I'm, I'm hoping that, that other scholars will come up and say, no, it can't possibly be music, it's this! And we'll get some dialogue going, some, some argument. I mean, people were all into magic and spells and games. Could it be dance notation? Could it be astrological? Could it be a puzzle in the sense of a, a game? I wonder whether it, it could have been some sort of recipe or some sort have some meaning that, that um, might seem cranky to us today, but at the time was taken quite seriously. What is annoying is that the head of the woman who's <laughs> inside the, the frame has no symbols that show that she might be an embodiment of an allegory of music. At the moment it's a plausible explanation, but we don't, we don't know for sure I can't rule out uh, a, a different approach that you see in, in medieval and early Renaissance buildings, say. So maybe we're reading too much into this. This programme was produced by Joe Carr Hollins, Jadwiga Skiba and Vivian Kinnear. With thanks to our contributors, Barbara Rafferty, John Donaldson, Barnaby Brown and Bill Taylor.